the life of God in me. I've got the life of God in me. I've got his life, his nature, and his ability. I've got the life of God in me. Amen. 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 Well, praise God. I'd like to welcome you guys to Friday Night Bible Studies. You know, we're going live here. And, and uh, um, first of all, like I said, I'd just like to welcome you guys for coming out tonight and for those of us joining us uh, live on uh, uh, Facebook. Uh, not to put them on the spot, but first of all, we'd like to welcome Rich, Brother Rich, amen. So, uh, so praise the Lord, my brother's going to be joining us, amen. If it's right, amen. So he's with us, so we got locked in. So praise God, Bible amen. studies is growing. It's good to see what, what, what God's doing. Like I was talking with Frank, when something's alive, when something's healthy, what does it do? It naturally grows. We don't gotta force it. We don't gotta do anything. We don't gotta bend people's arms. It just grows. And that's that's how it is when God's involved. And then when we're healthy, when we're spiritually healthy, uh, things will naturally grow. You guys are keeping your minds and your hearts on God. What's gonna happen? We're gonna grow spiritually. And, and that's our goal, is not to be the same people that we are. If you guys know those of us that have been here with me the longest, remember, uh, I think maybe what, maybe seven, eight months ago, we weren't as big as, as, as we were back then, but we stood faithful and, and we did what God called us to do and, and praise God and look what God's uh, already doing. Amen? So it's a privilege uh, for me to be able to minister and, and, and tonight. So what God, the message that God put in my heart this evening, and, and based on, their, on the situations that I've seen that we're going through a, as a church and things that uh, corporately we're, we're seeing, things that are happening in our lives and everything, uh, I titled tonight's message, Who is in Control of Your Life? One of the things that Pastor talked about was for us to start, uh, uh, as we're getting close to conference, to minister on on a message of treasures out of darkness, okay? That means if y'all know what treasures out of darkness means, right? Okay, somebody tell me what they think treasures out of darkness means. Anybody? The refiner's fire. Refiner's fire. God removes all the rules out of your life. Okay, anybody else? There's no right or right, wrong answers here, remember? As the Bible study. Anything? Treasures out of darkness. You can see? You can go ahead, Sister Danielle. Um, he's taking out all of the ugly and replacing it with gold and taking basically the things that come with potter's gold uh -huh. and changing us and taking out what needs to be taken out, whether it be ugliness or cutting or perversion or lust or lying or stealing. It could be any one of those things. Uh -huh. Okay. You go and say perseverance. Perseverance. Like coming out on top. Mm -hmm. You know, the trials can be the dark, the darkness. Mm -hmm. You know, the treasures. Okay. Go ahead. Or uh, sounds like uh, whatever is in darkness will come to light. Right? Anybody else? Both are good answers. Treasures out of darkness. That means when things are going darkest in our. See, what we don't realize is saying that, that treasures out of darkness means you find treasures in darkness. Learning from, your yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. learning from your mistakes. Yeah, learning from our learning mistakes. From, learning from the I take it my it's saying that when we're in our darkest times, yeah. whether it be spiritually, 
physically, whatever, we're in our darkest times, you can find treasure. You know, like, 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 in our darkest times, you find that you have a perseverance that you didn't think you had before. You have the strength. And, 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 or it could be during these dark times that we discover that we're spiritually stronger than what we thought. So these are all good thoughts. And, and, and so I'm going to stay along that line in, in these next couple of weeks that are coming. And one of the things that God put in, in my heart, we're going to be talking a little bit also, is about the armor of God. Yeah. And we're going to see about those treasures that we have that are going to come out of darkness. Because if we're going through dark times in our lives, we're finding ourselves being in difficult situations, amen? But we can see, amen, that, that God can come through. That if we stay faithful, we stay... Watch out the camera. Oh, sorry. Keep ourselves focused on God that we're going to see God doing great things in our lives. So to kick it off, tonight's message, we're going to start losing control of your life. We're going to be out of Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, verses, here's something that's going to shock a lot, and we're going to be in verses 1 through 20. <laughs> Take that one. So, have you ever been in a situation that seems hopeless? Have you, have, have you seen what happens to someone that's hopeless? In their minds, hopelessness means it's a no-win situation. But I want us to know this night that there is no such thing as a hopeless situation. Only people who think hopelessly. Now, for those of us that hopeless, the word hopeless means una, uh, uh, a person que no tiene esperanza. Una persona que piensa que no tiene remedio. There's no remedy. In our passage tonight, we're going to see a situation that when we first look at it, can seem hopeless to many of us. Okay, Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Before I start, let me go before the Lord. Heavenly Father, I praise you and I thank you, Lord, yes. for your goodness and your mercy, Father. I pray, Lord, that in the next few moments that we have, Father, that your Holy Spirit will just establish its presence, Father. Lord, we pray against any distractions from the enemy, Father, that might come against us, Father. We pray whatever things that are pressing in our minds, Lord, that we just release them and set them aside, Father. I pray that some of the principles that we'll talk about this evening, Lord, that you'll help us, Lord, to apply it to our spiritual lives, Father. I pray, Lord, that we won't leave this place like we came, Lord, but that we will be strengthened and encouraged, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, Father. I pray, Lord, that you increase as I decrease, Father, as I give you all the praise and all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Verse 1. Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man who had an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces. Neither could anyone tame him, and always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying out and cutting himself with stones. It seems something that you would see on TV nowadays. It seems that there you have this guy who was demonically, who was, who was in total subjugation of the enemy. What do I mean by subjugation? It means that the enemy had totally given himself over to Satan, where Satan not only had possessed him, but Satan was in control and dictated all his actions to him. In other words, he could do nothing. It seems that this man, it said that, that, that you know, he had no disregard. And it, this man was always in the tombs crying out and cutting himself. Isn't that, don't we see that today nowadays too? We see that so many of us, maybe even some of us in our life, we cut ourselves. You see, that's something that a lot of teens do, a lot of youth do, is they cut themselves. People cut themselves because of pain. There's different reasons. That's just an entire subject in itself. I've read about it, and, and, and it, it, it's just how people use to cope with things. But in this story, 
as we read, as we read this story, we're going to see that there are three different forces at work in this story. First of all, we're going to see the first one is Satan. That's one of the forces there. Secondly, we're going to see society. And thirdly, we're going to see the Savior, Jesus Christ. And these forces are still at work in our world today. First, we see a vivid picture. We see an example of what Satan can do to people. In John chapter 10, verse 10, the Bible, we're told in the Bible that Satan is a thief and a robber whose ultimate purpose is what? To seek, kill, and destroy. To kill, rob, and destroy us. To kill our spiritual life. Satan's purpose in our life is to kill you. He wants to destroy you. may not be physically, but he wants to kill you spiritually. That's why you see the attacks that are coming to your life. Sister Roxanne, not putting her on the spot, but she did say something good. She said, wanted to know our salvation. Why we're saved. Why is that important? Why? Because Satan will rob you of your joy. If you do not know why you're a Christian, I was talking to Mark about it, if we do not know why we are that we're saved, then you are an easy picking for the enemy. The Bible says that my people are destroyed because of what? Lack of knowledge. In other words, we don't have understanding. We don't read the word of God, so then when the enemy comes, guess what? We're not able to see the enemy's assaults. I think it's normal that's arguing with me. I see it's normal, it's Priscilla that's agitating me. Why? Because I'm not seeing spiritual. I'm not saying that my, my daughter and my wife are Satan in the making, but Satan sometimes uses us to get to you. To get to people, that's right, to bring division, to come against one another. That's why, yes, that's why we need to have spiritually have a relationship with God to realize that it's not that person, it's not that brother that I'm having issues with. No, it's just the devil that's bringing that uh, issue to you to get you to get distracted by that. Because as close as you get to him, the more he's going to attack. Right. He wants to kill you. He wants to kill you. We yeah, know, we know that. He wants to kill yeah. you. So he wants to rob you. Rob you of what? Rob you of your joy. Of your faith. Rob you of your peace. Yes, your faith. Because why? If he robs your joy, he robs you of your peace, then we are hopeless. Yep. Why is it that you see a lot of Christians commit suicide? It's not just the, not, not just the people in the world, but we see it happening to Christians. Why? Because the Satan is so good that he makes you see that there's no hope. And there's no knowledge makes you see that, you know what, there's no end, there's no solution to it. So he wants to rob you. Rob you of living, uh, 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 of living a life for God. Rob you uh, uh, of being, uh, uh, of having joy in your life. Yeah. Wants to rob you of seeing what you don't have instead of seeing what God has given you and where you're at. Like I say all the time, I may not be where I want to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. That's right. So he wants to kill you, he wants to rob you, and he wants to destroy you. Destroy you to where you are ineffective. You are doing nothing for God. Because of Satan's power in this man's life, the man had lost everything. He had lost everything. He lost his home, he lost his family, and he lost his friends. See, we may not be under demonic possessions, but how many of us as Christians, even now in our lives, we've lost homes, we lost our homes. We lost family, we lost friends. We didn't stay the course, enemy came in and messed us up. This man also said, look at this, and then we wonder why is it that where we end up surprised when we find out, oh, look at what this Christian was involved with, or we find out what we were dealing with, or what kind of hidden sins we're dealing with. Look at this man. This man not only lost his home, he lost his family, and he lost his friends, but what else did he lose? He lost his sense of decency. 
Why? The Bible says that he was running around what? Naked. Yeah, he was naked. And he wants to rob you of your decency. He lost his self control and he lived like an animal. You ever been so involved in your sin in your life? I know I have. I've been caught up in wanting to commit this sin that I'm struggling with so much that, that I'm willing to risk everything just to get that satisfaction of that sin. And what happens once you commit it, then Satan's there to kick you and to make you feel guilty. And once I feel guilty, he brings condemnation. I come to church, can't raise my hands in worship. He robs you. Totally, he destroys you. He lives us. He had this man living like an animal, screaming, cutting himself, and frightening the citizens. But most importantly, he lost his peace and his purpose for living. Isn't that what happened to Samson? Was it Samson's eyes got gouged out? He was bound. We found him grinding in a mill. He was a slave. This is a man who had a calling in his life. This is a man who had strength. Talk about not some of these marble comics where they have all these make believe guys. This guy was an action hero. But the enemy got the best of him, and look what happened in his life. Sure, it's a story of redemption because he gave his life right and got back right with God and God used him. But he didn't live, he didn't live out his entire life the way God intended it to be. If he would have stayed the course, he would have done greater things for him. See, this is the kind of destruction Satan hopes to bring into your life and my life. This is the same thing for the guy that's actively involved in church and in ministry as far as, and also to the person that, you know what, I don't want to get involved or just my Sunday and Wednesday goer. Which I actually believe a Sunday and Wednesday, uh, Wednesday goer actually go through it a lot more. Because all he has to get you is to stop going to church. Once you miss one service, it gets easier to miss the second, third, fourth service. And before you know it, it's been a month, two months, down the line. We're like, well, I'm okay. I, 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 I've been all right. I haven't fell into sin. We give it time because the enemy sets us up for the fall. And one of the biggest mistakes Christians do, us as Christians, we underestimate the destructive power of Satan, of what he can do in your life and in my life. I don't go looking for Satan. I'll be the first one to tell you that. I'm not looking for Satan everywhere at all. That doesn't mean that I'm scared of Satan. The enemy comes at me, I deal with it with the authority and power that God has given us. But I'm not, I don't go looking for him. I don't go challenging him. I don't go to say, you ever heard Christians say, oh, devil's a punk and devil's this and, and, and later with him. And, and you ever heard people talk like that? You've heard them like that. And what happens? A couple of weeks later, you find out what happened to that brother. Man, God took a, the enemy took him out. That's like I said, I'm not foolish enough to go challenge the enemy. If the enemy comes at us the way we, we do, we use the responsibility, the authority that God has given us, we deal with it, and we go on. And we don't go, I don't. I don't suggest you guys doing that yet. Amen. See, I want you also, not only of the power of Satan, but I also want you to notice where this demon-possessed man was living. Where was he living? In the tombs. He was hanging out in the cemetery. See, the demons are comfortable hanging around that which is dead. I mean, think about it. This would not be our first pick for a day to, to go to the cemetery or to the morgue. 
I remember when I first met Norma, I didn't tell Norma, hey, God, you want to go walk around the tube store? Or you want to go hang out at the board? I didn't do that. See, the cemetery or the morgue is not a place, it's not really a place that I even feel comfortable. Why? Because I'm alive. I don't want to be surrounded by things which are which remind me of death. But yet this man is living among the Jews. See, we're, we like being around things that are alive, that we're alive, and that we're alive in Christ. See, the first thing we see is Satan is alive and work and working his work of destruction. The next force we see at work in this story is society. When it came to society, society didn't know what to do with this man. First, they tried to bind him, lock him up, but that didn't do the trick. Same problem as today. You know that 72% of those people getting out of prison will be rearrested again. Isolate him, society says. Institutionalize him. Our society says, but when that doesn't work, what does society do? They throw their hands up in the air and say, we don't know what to do with them. Right. So what, is, uh, what do they do? Well, let's turn them loose now. Now we see them doing crazy things. Now they want to turn them loose. And what, basically what they're saying is let's turn them loose and hope that they don't bug us. You know, in, in, in Stockport, England, this is true, they have a school for 16 through 19 year olds. You know, at that school, they have a bar, a full functioning bar on every floor in that school. Then they wonder why teenagers nowadays are acting like animals in regards to one another. We see the society, how they're killing each other. I've watched on YouTube, and sometimes I'll be watching on YouTube. I, I, I'm seeing guys walking down the street, and there's these old people, and all of a sudden they end up punching them for no reason. There's totally disrespect. What's happening in our society? What's happening? What, what do you think? You know, we're a little bit older. We're older already. I'm worried about my grandson. You know, all the kids in there, what they are going to be subjected to, what they are going to be going through. We see that, but we don't do nothing. How effective are we in our prayer life for them? How much prayer is going out for your children, for your grandchildren? How much time are we spending in the Word of God? How much time are we doing it? We, we, we don't. It's almost like we don't want to bother our children. As an usher, I'm watching back there. How many times in service I'm watching kids while pastors ministering, everybody's on their phone. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, ask Norm and some of you guys that are in the back, you see me. I'll stand right behind them sometimes and I'm watching them and what they're looking at. They're watching... Um, uh, TikTok. TikTok. Facebook. Like they're doing this. Right. I'm like, man, what? There's no respect. Parents don't do nothing. Then we wonder why. Then we act all crazy. We act all shocked when we see our kids doing crazy things. Once we want to, we, we expect the school to raise our kids. So what does the school say? Well, the answer is let's make them wear a uniform. Let, 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 let's put metal detectors at school. We see teens acting like animals as, as it relates to sexuality. What does our school tell them? In society, it says give them condoms. Let's teach them how to have safe sex. That's what you're teaching our kids. Yeah. Our society is very much like it is in Mark chapter 5. We see that they go from trying one thing to another until they throw their arms up in the air and they say, we don't know what to do. Well, let me keep going. We'll come back to society after. <laughs> but let's look at what happens when our Savior enters the scene. Look at the verse 6. 
It says, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him. Who ran and worshipped him? He. Who? He. Legion. Satan. It doesn't mean the worship we came. If you look at that word worship, it's talking about paying homage. Anybody know what homage means? Uh, give me honor. honor that they deserve. What do I mean? I'll give you an example. The Prince of Wales or the King of Wales or when the President, we pay undue respect to the President. You see everybody standing in line. They pay respect to him. Respect that he deserves. That's what these demons were doing. It wasn't that they were worshiping God like the way we worship God. They were worshiping. They were paying homage that they needed to do. Because he was the king of kings. He was God. And they cried out with a loud voice in verse 7, what have, what have I to do with you, Jesus, son of the most high God? I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Now I ask you, in looking at this story, who's in control here? The Lord. The Lord. The Lord. Do you notice that Jesus hasn't even said anything to this man? It's just the presence of God. He hasn't said anything to the demoniac. In our lives, just by us being in prayer and seeking the Lord, we see what the presence of God can do in our lives. Amen. When we're fully devoted to God, when we see ourselves really committed, living a holy life, living righteously, for the Lord, we see what a difference it makes. Amen. Jesus just shows up on the scenes and the demon and the demons are all freaking out just by his presence. Right. Do the demons break out when they see us coming? Yeah. yeah they sure do. All the time. You're right? It should be. Or but see, the demons know who we are. Do they freak out when they see us? Or, hey, how's it going, Robert? <laughs> Happy to see you. Because we're not a threat to them. Because they know how I live my life. They know what I'm doing when Norma's not there. <laughs> What do you do when no one's watching? That's the person God wants to touch. That's the person God wants to minister to. Here comes Jesus. And they freak out and they realize that they're in trouble. They say, please, Jesus, don't hurt us or torment, or torment us. This should really solidify our stance in knowing that the power that Jesus has over Satan, over demonic forces, that should tell you the power that Jesus has, the power that God has given us in our lives, living, having the Lord in our lives, the power that, it, that the enemy, that we have over the enemy. You ever heard people, Christians, wonder, can a Christian be demon from them? Can he? No, a Christian cannot be demon. He can't. You can't, a, 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 a demon cannot possess a Christian. He can have strongholds in our lives, but he cannot possess us. See, because Jesus and a demon cannot coexist in the same body. It's impossible. The Bible declares in 1 John, it declares that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. And we see from here that demons don't want to be where Jesus is at. That's another one. Demons don't want to be where Jesus is at. If Jesus is living in my heart, demons don't want to be around me. Again, do they want to be around us? No. Are we actually a threat to them? So Jesus and demons cannot coexist in a person. But guess what? If there's compromise 
And if you're not living the way, if you're not living right for the Lord, and Jesus isn't in the center of your life, then guess what? You are open game to the enemy. Jesus was in complete charge of this scene. Verse 8. For he said to him, Come out of this man, unclean spirit. Then, verse 9, Then he asked him, What is your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. And also he begged him earnestly that he would not send them out of the country. A legion was 6,000 uh, Roman troops. So in other words, this man had 6,000 demons begging Jesus for mercy power of our Lord and Savior. Amen. This should be assures us that the devil has no power over your life. Understand that tonight. Demons have no power over your life. Amen. They have no power whatsoever. Only what you give him. By listening to his lies. But wait, you may say, doesn't the Bible say that the devil's like a roaring lion, seeking who he may devour? Yes, it's true as it relates to the believer, but he is a toothless lion who has been declawed. I was watching with my grandson, walking with little pops, and there's this little dumb chihuahua that's that, that little aggressive little dog, and, and he's just barking and barking. And I go like this to him, and you know, they're small little dogs, you know, they. They run away like that. Guess what? I'm going like this to him, and he does it, but Pops gets scared. So guess what the little Chihuahua does? He starts trying to mess with Pops. He starts, you know, he doesn't go after me because he knows I'm scared of what? He's going after him because he's scared of me. Right. Because Pops shows the scared. scared. Right. Yeah. And that's the way Satan is in our lives. You stand up to the enemy, but if we don't, because we don't know our position and who we are, because I'm compromising, I'm not right with the Lord, I'm trying to live with one foot in the world and one foot in church, then we realize why the enemy's coming against us and we don't know what we're doing, so we start dealing with all this, sin starts overwhelming in my life, I start getting confused, I don't know what to do, and all of a sudden the enemy comes in and just has a heyday with me. Without us realizing that he's been declawed, he has no teeth. Think of a dog that, you know, with no teeth and no claws. In other words, what can you can do? He can dump you. He can bark all he wants. He can bark all he wants. Even if he does bite you, he's going to dump you. Right? He can't do anything. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15 says, Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them. He disarmed them. He publicly made a skeptic, uh, spectacle out of them. First John five eighteen says, "He who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him." You should underline and memorize that verse. First John five eighteen: He who has been born of God keeps himself, and the wicked one does not touch him. James four seven says, "Therefore submit to God, resist the devil." And he will flee from you. What's the first thing you need to do? Is be submitted to God. Secondly, resist the devil. Meaning, don't listen to him. Okay. Tune him out. And let's finish up here. Mark 5, verse 11 says, Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. At, and at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out and entered the swine. There was about 2,000, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. Note this. These demons say, if we can't be in a person, then please, can we go into the pigs? That tells you what the enemy thinks about you. It makes no difference to the demons. Pigs, it doesn't matter. His goal is to make us pigs, to turn you and me into pigs. In fact, demons seek to act, to make us act like we're pigs, self indulging pigs. That's because we're humans, which is like God's children. And pigs are beneath that, so we can take our identity as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. That's 
Because as, like, as his children, we have an inheritance, and animals were used to feed those children with inheritance. Mm -hmm. You understand that's good. It's good, that's what he wants to do. You have an inheritance. Who we are as Christians, the Bible tells us we can live our life victoriously. But isn't that like him trying to destroy our image on who God is bringing us to be? Yes. That's his ultimate goal is to destroy us. To destroy what God wants to do in your life and in my life. See, Rich, Ignacio, Frank, Glenn, Rocky, Mauricio, myself, your men. And his goal is to take out the men. They will press the ladies. He wants to destroy the, our wives. Now, let me, let me say this correctly. Us as men, he wants to destroy the men because if he can get the father out of the picture, it makes it easier for the kids to fall and it makes it easier to come at the woman. Well, it, gives it, it seems like it's giving them full control that if they get the father out of the house, then the kids are going to fall out of place and then he can have control over the mother. That's why it says, scattered, it says, hit the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Mm -hmm. We are the head. As much as you women love and are worshiping God, and I praise God for that, that's good. But as men, he wants to destroy the men. He totally wants to kill you, take you out of the picture because you become easier pickings. And, and single moms and, and women here, don't get me wrong, I, I know you guys do an outstanding work with our kids and our children and raising them and, and like that. But there's something different when a man is not there, that the enemy comes in and tries to assault us. And, and tries to take us out and what we become open we leave our children open to the assaults of the enemy that's why you're called to be the priest of the home you're called the one to be the one to lead the home you're supposed to lead the home in prayer and worshiping and loving god that's why you guys need to be guys need to be here in, in, in church even if our wives don't want to be Huh? Good word. No, no I, I, like I said, I'm just saying because I know I have to be here at a certain time. I come here because that's my my thing to be here. And but that's how it should be, regardless, guys. Whether wife wants to go to church or not, you guys need to be in church. You guys, you guys do need to, because you are the one that leads the home. Wives do too. Wives is very important that you guys come to church too. But the enemy wants to destroy the husband because there's that covering and it makes it just easier. See, pigs, like Roxanne said, were unclean. Jews were not even to eat or to, to eat them or be around them or especially raise them. But what happened here that we see them all of a sudden raising big? Well, if you go back to the Old Testament, you realize that it used to be, uh, it was a Jewish city before. They were raising cattle before. Somehow, between the New Testament, Old Testament and New Testament, they went from pigs, they went from cattle to pigs. Why? Because of compromises. So Jesus, when he comes over here, He's already this day exposing their disobedient heart. Look at verse 14. It says, So those who, who fed the swine fled, and they told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that had happened. When they came to Jesus and saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind, they were afraid. And those who saw it told them how it happened, who had been demon-possessed, and about the swine. So they began to plead with him to depart from their region. This is amazing to me. The people come out to see this guy that, that they couldn't do anything for him, and all of a sudden they see this man clothed and sitting and in his right mind, and they don't understand it. And instead of getting all excited because they see what's happening, what do they do? They tell Jesus, Jesus, get out of here. 
We don't want to give. They were more concerned about their pigs than in, some, than in the right mind. They, they see this man who had been delivered. This man who had been, that's, and that's how it is today. We see society didn't want anything to do with us guys. Those of us that, you know, we were a bad influence into this world, but now that they see us, they see us serving and, and, and serving God, what do they say? They still don't want anything. They're most concerned is about society. They're more concerned about their pigs instead of seeing the lives that are being changed. Instead of seeing people that are being transformed and renewed. People seeing that lives are being radically changed by Jesus. They should be rejoicing, but no, they're not rejoicing. They're worried about their pigs. These people asked Jesus to leave. Why? Because he was a threat to their pig industry. They were more concerned with money than mercy. They were more concerned with pigs than with people. But Jesus, on the other hand, demonstrating the value of a person that people are more valuable than pigs. Our society teaches that our kids came from monkeys. That's what they teach. Then they act surprised when they see young people acting like apes. <laughs> if you teach a child that he came from an animal, you can expect him to act like an animal. But if you teach him that he was made in the image of God and teaching him that he is uniquely and, and that he is more valuable than animals, that he has a unique destiny, that he was made for the glory of God to live forever with God, then that when they begin to realize that, they begin to see that they are important. What is it that we're feeding our children? What is it that you're telling your kids? You're telling your kids to shut up? You're telling your kids that they're a nuisance, but don't bother me? Are we spending time with our children? You know, I see you both coming down here, and you know, I know you with your daughter, Ivania, and I see you guys be coming out faithfully. Well, you guys both take that's, that's great to see what God's doing in your lives. Because it's important that we make a difference. If you want to see change in our kids, it's in, in, it, it, it isn't uh, more is caught than taught. You can teach your kids all you want, but they're going to see more by our actions. They're going to see the way you act. Yep. That's why our kids can be here and they, they, they can see us. And my girls can be here and they can see, they can see, wow, oh, look at, look at Pop, uh, Poppy here is teaching and teaching Bible study. But if they see me acting like a devil at the house, well, well, what's that going to do to their walk? What example are they going to see, right? What are they going to see in our lives? People around you, are they looking at your life? Do they see you living one way in church? And yet you're treat, I'm, treating, uh, 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 I'm treating my wife bad at home? Or our kids are here, they see, you know, and, and the kids are here seeing mom and dad all happy, but they see that they see mommy kind of treating dad bad because he's not acting right. These people today are like those in our culture. They value pigs more than people. So what do they do? They tell Jesus to leave. And what does Jesus do? Does Jesus protest? Does he form a rally? Does he push his way through? No, he left. Why? Because God's not going to force himself in your life. It's laid out before you. You can live for God or you cannot live for God. But it's ultimately going to be your choice. You're going to be responsible for the decisions you make. We're getting to the point in our walk with God today that you can play around all you want with God or you can be serious with God. But I can guarantee you as times get worse and we see it happening, it's going to get worse and it's going to get darker. And the Bible talks about Matthew 24 that there's going to be a delusion, a delusion that's going to fall upon us. That he says even God's elect are going to be deceived. That means you can deny, you can, we can deny the spirit of God all we want, but there's going to be a delusion. That means a delusion is going to be scales, you're going to be put in your eyes that you're not going to be able to see. Powerful. Huh? Yes. Powerful. You're going to see that things are going on in your life that you're seeing you're going on the way to hell and you don't, and, and you don't see it. You'll be believing. I'm telling you, you're going to be surprised when you see who makes it in heaven and who doesn't. What gets me is that we're going to see a lot of people that we thought, hey, well, I used to be with them in church, and we're going to see people that, 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 wow, they didn't make it to heaven. 
and people that we thought that weren't going to be there and are there. This is what happens in our private time. Amen. Guys, this isn't a time, ladies and gentlemen, to, for us to be playing around in our relationship with God. We have to get serious about what's happening. This time is getting worse and worse. And if you see it, 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 all you have to do is look at YouTube. Look at typing Christian persecution. Watch what's happening to the Christians. People that are standing up for God. People getting arrested for teaching the word, for ministering the word of God. For giving LGBTQ or whatever they're called, they're giving them all this mm -hmm. transgender, all this crazy stuff that's happening. A bunch of nonsense. We're, we're a joke to, to the world. Yes. Yes. And guess what? The more and the more that people keep denying God, he's not going to force himself. When we keep allowing these things in our lives, guess what? There's going to come a time when we have a, there's God's grace. There's a God's grace that's around us. And I believe that God lets us go to a certain point and he's always pushing us back. But guess what? Eventually, you keep pushing and pushing. There's going to come a time where God's going to say, hey, you know what? Go for it then. And we're going to be like the, what's the saddest scripture in the Bible? I've always told you guys, it's in Judges, where Samson, where, where Samson gets up and he says, you know what? I'm going to get up like I've done before. And it says that he wakes up and he realized, and he did not know that the Spirit of God had met him. The saddest scripture in the Bible to you wake up one day and you think, oh, it's just going to be good. You know, I'm going to go out and do what I do. And you don't realize that the Spirit of God has left you. Then you end up falling apart. You find you've been destroyed, he robbed you, and he killed you spiritually. He killed you to the point where you have no desire for God. You become bitter, angry. When he got into the boat, verse 18, he who had been demon possessed begged him that he might be with him. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you, and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and he began to proclaim in the capitalist all that Jesus had done for him and all marvel. Now, I love this. Because Jesus said, You have a story to tell. The man begged Jesus. The ultimate proof of Christianity is a changed life. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened here. This man's transformed and he begs Jesus. Jesus said, go with me. But Jesus says, no, go back to the city. He goes, you have a story to tell, so go and share it. Regardless of where you're at, you have a story to tell of what God has done in each of your lives. Jesus says, go and tell people what I did for you. And the, what was the result of him going? A strong church was built in that area because of this man. Can one person make a difference? Absolutely. Yes. One person in your family, one person totally sold out for God. Even if Norman, and I think he's in my life as an example, but even if Norman doesn't want to share God, if I do it, I establish the presence. Mm -hmm. Or if the wife is there and the husband doesn't want to keep playing games and forget him, you keep serving God with all you can, you will affect that home. Husband or wife, all it takes is one person sold out for God. This, there's a spiritual battle underway that's going on right now. Whose side are you on this night? Jesus plainly said, if you are not for me, you are against me. That's right. There's no neutral ground. You're either serving God or you're not. And I tell you, and I'm done, look at your life this way. I always tell you guys this every once in a while. Go back three months. Compare your walk to God tonight to three months ago. Are you more on fire for God? Is your prayer life stronger? Is your time in the Word longer? 
because you're either more honest to God or you're not. Christianity demands that you cannot be the same person you were three months ago. Amen. You're either hotter, more stronger for the things of God, or you're not. But you are not the same person. Impossible. Impossible. You cannot be the same person you were three months ago. You're either more on fire for God, your time in the Word is longer, Fellowship with God more, or you're not, or you're farther apart. That's only you can tell where you're at tonight. And God help us to understand what's going on now. Where am I in my walk? get excited about when I'm spending time in the Word when I'm watching more TV than I am with the things of God. Yeah. I may go to fellowship with everybody. I can be brother fellowship. But I don't fellowship with God. The danger is, you know, even the church can become a club. Mm -hmm. Instead of being a place where we come and worship our God. But be forewarned. Like Pastor said, Pastor does not give warnings. That's why I ask you, my brother, that those of you guys know that come to our Bible study, that God a couple of weeks ago gave him a warning. Gave it over the pulpit. Those of you that were there at service, he warned one of our brothers. They come here for our Bible study. God's giving us a warning, guys. This isn't a time to be playing around. So we're going to wake up one day and we're going to find that the Spirit of God has left us. God forbid that happens. Amen. 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 Any questions or comments? Good stuff. Nailed it. Good word. I'm glad. Not saying that I was in a bad place, you know what I mean? But it's like, if I'm going to throw off the trash, you know, something will try to hit me or something will just fall out of nowhere. Like, nope, you're like, I'm going, you know, something, I'll be driving or somebody will just cut in front of me. And it just, it, it's a lot different, it's a lot better, I know that for sure. And it's only gonna get better. Mm -hmm. That's all I can say. Keep that fire for God. Pray, read the word of God, spend time with them, fellowship with God, come to church, pray simple. The enemy tries to separate us, take us out. Yeah. You don't let nothing come between this body and study. You stay strong, you stay focused on God, and watch what God's going to do in our lives. We're not perfect, guys. By God, all means, I don't have it all together. I don't. I'm still learning with my way. But as we work together, we stay united. We're going to see God do great things in our life. Amen. Amen. Father, Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this time that you've given us, Lord. Lord, you have been so good to us, Father. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, for your word this night, Lord, for this message you put in my heart, Father. Lord, I, I'm so glad and thankful to see, Lord, that you are so much powerful than any demonic force, anything that the enemy has, Father. You defeated the enemy at the cross, Father. I thank you, Lord, and I pray, Lord, we, for all of us here this night and for those watching us on Facebook, Lord, that, that, Lord, that we continue to draw closer and get more hungry for you, Father. And I pray for that, Lord, that we have more of you in our lives, Father, so that, Lord, the enemy can, can see the presence of God working in our lives, Father. 
Lord, help us, Lord, to be a light in this dark world, Father. Help us, Lord, as your word says that we are the salt of this earth, Father. And I pray, Lord, help us with our testimony, Lord, with our lives. Help us in our marriages, Father God, as men of God, to love our wives, Lord, as you have loved the church, Father. Help us to love our wives with respect, Father, and honor them, Father. Let us be the, the man of God in our homes, Lord. Let us lead our children, Lord, our grandchildren, Lord. Help us, Lord, so that, that, that compromise begins in our home, Lord. If we want to get our home straight, then, Lord, it begins with us, Father. Let us be the agents of change. Father, we welcome your Holy Spirit into our lives and ask you, Lord, just to come in and just have your way, Father. Deal with us, the issues in our lives, Lord. Those of us that we may have secret sin in our lives or things that we're struggling with, Father, I pray, Lord, help us, Lord, to bring these things out in the open, Father, that, Lord, we'll be able to be set free, Father, and we can be an example to those that are in bondage, Lord, to those in the world that are suffering and hurting, Father, that are in need of a savior father help us lord not to be silent father as your word says that your your word lord as we eat your word lord became a fire in our souls father that we could not contain it lord but that we will be a light father and just share father your goodness lord to share what you have what you've done for us in our lives father help us lord not to want the things of this world father help us not to choose Things, Lord, over you, Father, but we desire to have you in our lives, Lord. Help us, Lord. Help our church, Lord. Help those on Facebook that are watching us, Lord. Help us, help us, Lord, to, to fall in love with you more, Lord, to seek after you, Father. For we need you, Father, in our lives, Father. Help us in our times, Lord, that we're going through these difficult times in our lives. Lord, help us to know what is right, Lord, and to do what is right, Father. Help us not to be uh, ashamed, Lord, or fearful of the enemy's strategies, Father. But, Lord, let us love them, Father, and hunger after you, Father. Lord, we draw closer unto you this night, Father. I pray blessings over the Bible study here this night, Father, and over the people watching us on Facebook, Father. Bless them, bless their homes, Father. Help us to be the people of God that you desire for us to be, Father. We ask you, Lord, is to forgive us of our sins, Lord. Forgive us of our trespasses. Forgive us for having unforgiveness in our lives or hatred or anger after one another. Forgive us, Lord, if we've been causing division, Father. If we've been backbiting, Father. If we've been gossiping, Lord. Help us, Lord, to lay these things aside, Father. Lord, we love you, Father. And we give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise this evening. In your precious name we pray, Father. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you guys for watching us on Facebook. And God bless you. We'll see you next Friday. God bless.